The Michigan DNR Hunt Fish app is your digital connection to all things hunting and fishing in Michigan. Buy, store, and display your hunting and fishing licenses, check your points and chances for elk and bear, apply for the draw, and view drawing results. Access all the hunting and fishing regulations, view your hunter safety certificate, and report your harvest, all from within the Michigan DNR Hunt Fish app. Just click the app banner at the top of the page for download instructions at michigan.gov hunting. You know what that sound means. It's time for the Michigan DNR's Wild Talk Podcast. Welcome to the Wild Talk Podcast, where representatives from the DNR's Wildlife Division chew the fat and shoot the scat about all things habitat, feathers, and fur. With insights, interviews, and your questions answered on the air, you'll get a better picture of what's happening in the world of wildlife here in the great state of Michigan. Welcome to the Wild Talk Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Lincoln, and here with me today to kick off the seventh season of the Wild Talk podcast is our show producer and dialogue extraordinaire, Eric Hilliard. Happy New Year. Welcome to 2024. It's amazing that we're in 2024. I'm hoping that it starts off on a positive note for everyone. Um, I like New Year's, so hopefully this is a good one. If you listen to our last episode, I'm a fan of the even numbers of this year. So 2024 sounds really good to me. It has a pleasing ring to it. Yeah. Plus, we're like 12 years past when the world was supposed to end now. Look at us. Go us. Well, this should be a great episode. Our special guest, Bill Skellen, will join us to shed some light on the wintry happenings for wildlife in the Upper Peninsula. And then we'll take to the skies with one of Michigan's most majestic winter visitors, the snowy owl. And for our final segment, we'll chat about the southern bog lemming and a small yet active critter this time of year. And of course, somewhere in the episode, there will be a chance to win one of the Wild Talk podcast camp mugs. As always, we are excited to bring you a fresh episode filled with wildlife facts and interesting critter bits. Uh, But before we dive into the podcast, let's hear a word from our forest. Trees provide for the well-being of our state. That's why we work so hard to keep our forests healthy and abundant. So wildlife has a home. And so do people. So that there's clean air and water for everyone. And so Michigan's economy can be as strong as the trees that support it, because every branch of forestry ensures that future generations will always have a tree for life and forests for a lifetime. To learn how sustainable forestry benefits your life, visit michigan.gov slash forests for a lifetime. joined by Bill Scullin, the Field Operations Manager of the Upper Peninsula Region, to chat about some of the awesome work going on this winter in the UP. Thanks for joining us today, Bill. Pleasure to be here. Well, what are some of the the projects your region has been tackling this past quarter? They've been really busy. Everyone's been really busy, you know, prior to the hunting season, trying to wrap up all their field work, all their field habitat projects. And they've been working on just a wide variety of really cool stuff. Traditional habitat projects, but there's some really neat projects people are doing. A couple examples out of Shingleton, they're working on a couple of large areas where they're restoring native grasses and uh, native prairie components. One of them is an old prison site. The land reverted back to the state. So this is right on M28. So they're restoring about 40 acres to native plant species, and they're trying to make it in. So it's right on the highway, so it's going to be a kind of a stopping area for people, a recreational area, a trail, maybe a dog walking area. Uh, also a hunting area as well for grassland species. And so a wide variety of those kind of cool projects. They um, they have some of that work doing on three different large 56-acre openings in the Garden Gems down in Garden Peninsula, doing that kind of work. And Rainy Wildlife Management just north of Manistique, they restored an old historic boardwalk we had going out to a, a viewing platform on a river. Uh, they didn't restore it. They actually removed it because it was delinquent. And they restored the path, put it in geotextile fabric and then a gravel pathway that is a little more accessible year round and a lot safer. That was a big project. Up in Baragoff, they had a lot of projects working on uh, gems on the five mile points up the tip of the Keweenaw. It's a new area for us at the Sturgeon River Sloughs. It was a four year project culmination. We restored a bridge. We had a bridge wash out in a flood in the spring and took a lot of engineering, and a lot of expense. And we restored a bridge so it allows us to access half of the managed area across a river. But it also restores a snowmobile trail. So that was a, a big project to get that completed. They also have been experimenting with, and part of the uh, Sturgeon River Sluice is flooded impoundments. And some of those impoundments are basically like a forested bog. 
Uh, they don't get a whole lot of heavy use from hunters because it's difficult to access. Wildlife use utilize them. So what they're doing is they're out there mulching in some trails with a fecon machine, making it a little more accessible for bird walking, bird watching, and possibly hunting as well. So that's kind of a cool project. Down in Escanaba, they've been working on Limbeck Lake project with Coulter Lubin for several years now. It's 145 acres of openings that he's restoring to native warm season grasses. Um, it's a multi-year project. They've been working on getting that stuff done and open to the public. They had a prescribed burn in there this year. Cool thing that Coulter's working on in Portage Marsh, which is right in downtown Escanaba. It's a big flooded coastal wetland. And they've been looking at, we've had a lot of problems with not being able to maintain a hemi marsh, which is a 50% open, wet, open wetland marsh and emergent vegetation. So what we want to do is it's all cattails. It's basically choked off of cattails. So they, they've contracted with a guy with a special piece of equipment that goes in there and they, they basically have roller chopped 60 acres of cattail to create small openings throughout this whole entire complex to make it more utilized by wetlands, waterfall, and other uh, species, um, particularly muskrats in particular. So that's been a cool project. It's, it's a multi-year project, but that's been something that really a big project to pull together. As you can imagine, the permitting that's required for doing that kind of work and the logistics of getting specialized equipment to do that kind of work is it's a monumental task. So, and Coulter's also been working on doing some mulching in the, the Shaky Lakes Burns area. Uh, it's of oak pine barrens. So he did 30 acres of fecon work there, uh, creating suitable habitat conditions, and also a 225 acre burn this fall there as well. So there's been a lot of that kind of work in Marquette. Uh, they're working up at Autrain Basin, uh, creating a birding trail. This is um, Caleb Ekeloff working on this and Brian Roll. It's a cool project. It has a five mile loop um, with about 10 stops looking at different forest and, and grassland species and wetland species because Autrain is a unique area where we have a, an impoundment with a hydrologic dam that's owned by a private company that we have some ownership next to for waterfall hunting and things of that nature. But also goes through a forested system, and it also has a large grassland component adjacent that we manage. So you have a wide variety of, of birding opportunities there. And this is modeled after some of the work that that um, Jane uh, Rohr and Christy Sitar have done out of Newberry with some of the birding trail works they've done they've done over there. So staff have been busy all over the UP doing things, and not just all the habitat work, working up training. Uh, Rachel Leggett, our new technician in the Sioux, completed her CDL training this fall. So, which is a cool adventure for her. And the reason that's important for us is that, you know, all of our technicians have CDLs. We use our equipment. We share equipment around the region. So we don't have a plethora of equipment, heavy equipment to use. So it's important for us to be able to efficiently move it around the region and, and do these different kind of habitat projects, whether it be a dump truck, a bulldozer, a backhoe, or a fecon machine. So and they all they all really cooperate to get the work done. Um, if someone was interested in getting into the wildlife field and working on any of these awesome projects you just mentioned, would you recommend they pursue getting a CDL? It's not, it's not necessary. Many agencies at a field entry level, um, it's a good step to have certifications, you know, having all kinds of those kind of field-based certifications, special skills, whether it be fire training, um, basic chainsaw safety, any of those kind of basic training things are good. CDL is a pretty heavy investment for someone to put into prior to getting a job. Um, most agencies, once you're there, they'll pay for that training. And it's a six to $10,000 investment in training in, in weeks of time. So, Bill, that sounds like a lot of really awesome projects that you're working on to increase both public hunting opportunities, but also just wildlife viewing or general enjoyment of nature. So pretty awesome to hear the comprehensive list of projects you guys are working on. There was one big one I kind of forgot. Um, you know, across the region, we've been working on wild rice restoration for Quite a few years now. This year, we work we work routinely with Kiwana Bay Indian community to help us secure seed from sources in Minnesota that we then transplant in multiple state land locations, state water bodies across the UP. Uh, this year, they helped us secure almost 4,800 pounds of seed um, that we planted in like 10 different sites. Uh, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's 10 bucks a pound. And this is collected by someone in a canoe and then we go out and disperse it in canoes and, the, and with tribal systems across the region. And the whole idea is to, you know, promote wetland habitat for waterfowl as well as for, for, for individuals to collect wild rice. It's a very culturally important to the Ojibwe people as a, as a food source. And it's, it's a really cool species to work with. And we have a lot of cooperation with a lot of tribes on it. It's kind of a neat partnership project. What does planting wild rice from a canoe look like? Do you use any type of special device? It's pretty rudimentary. The trick is, it's collected in September. It's trucked usually overnight to us, kept wet the entire time. We put it in a water body that we have to store it for a day or two. 
like you soak it in water, leave it in a lake, basically. So it's in sacks. And then you disperse it to whoever's taking it, and they paddle out to a lake, and they just broadcast, the hand throw it in the in the defined spot where you want to try and establish a bed. And you're looking for the right depth level conditions and the right conditions within the lake to do it. And we do a lot of work to try and figure that out. Um, but yeah, and the it's kind of, it's like playing with insulation because it's real itchy, and it always has lots of little worms and stuff in it. So it's kind of a, and it smells bad. So it's, it's kind of, it has its downside. The cool side is that, Next spring, when you go back up and see it growing, you know, the wildlife love it. It's, it's really cool. What an interesting hands-on project. That sounds like a lot of fun. It is until you tip the canoe, but yes. You know, maybe uh, we should try to start some sort of a uh, new tradition, like at weddings, where instead of throwing the dry rice, uh, you throw the wet rice as they, you know, go out and jump into the car. They, they do recommend it so birds don't eat the dry rice. Awesome. Well, what's up next on the docket? Any big projects for the UP in the next quarter? Yeah, this winter, you know, we're coming out of deer season, so we're getting a lot of feedback from, from the public about how deer season did or didn't go. Um, and then we're amping up for spring planting seasons, spring habitat seasons. Uh, a lot of forest inventory work gets done in the wintertime, so staff are busy with that this winter, looking at timber sales, looking at timber stands that are proposed. So a lot of that kind of routine work behind the scenes. But that's how the state forest is managed. And it's really critical to how we do business. And really, at the, the big scale, impact wildlife habitat is through our forest inventory work. It's kind of sight unseen, but that's the meat and potatoes of what we do to impact wildlife habitat. Pretty much the backbone of the work that we do a lot of times, especially during these seasons. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, we'll have our normal field work surveys. We're going to do a wolf survey again this winter. So that will involve all of our staff spending a lot of time out in the field looking for wolf tracks. That's in conjunction with a new new camera trap survey we're doing with research uh, at wolves. So there's a lot of time spent afield looking at wildlife and the impacts of the winter on wildlife, measuring the snow, seeing how it's going to impact and what's going to come out of the spring. So you can measure snow levels to get an idea of how that's going to impact wildlife this spring? Yeah, we have a program we call it SnowDAS, and it's an automated weather system where we measure snow accumulation across the Upper Peninsula. And this is based with the with NOAA, and um, we use automated weather stations. and from that, we can predict how many days we have of 12 inches or more snow accumulated, how it's going to impact deer. It's similar to our old w weather severity index we used to do. So if we have more than 90 days of accumulated snow depth, it's going to impact deer severely. We had that last one. We had over 100 days. That's part of the reason why the deer season this year was pretty gloomy for a lot of people, because a lot of deer succumbed last few winter, especially when we have late, late winter snow events like we had last year. So deer, not only do they die in the wintertime throughout the winter, they die in the spring, even after the snow melts. They're so nutritionally stressed. Even when they're dispersing out of the winter confined areas, they're dying on the landscape. And that, that's what we had happen last winter in many areas. That was very interesting. Thanks for sharing, Bill. Have there been any additional impressive accomplishments that any of your team members have made this year? You know, they all have done outstanding work in every individual's case. Um, there's so many things I think they're trying to bring them, list them all out. We talked about Rachel getting her CDL. Well, that's just one thing. Um, Brian Roll recently promoted to be the large carnivore specialist. He was our biologist in Marquette. He's still going to be in Marquette, but he is now a large carnivore specialist, primarily responsible for wolves and cougars and things like that. Um, so that's kind of a unique role for us to have that embedded in the UP. Um, there's a lot of work that's been going on. Uh, John DePew has been working on the Net River Dam replacement. That, that saga is still ongoing since 2022. We stabilized the dam. Now we're in the phase of trying to permanently replace the dam. And repair it. Um, we're working with an engineering firm on that, we're building a coalition of partners to bring together funding to, to accomplish that task. Um, and he's working on bat surveys. Brian McGilvery's working on turkey work. You know, everybody's working on something someplace. Dave Gentile's working on all of our deer, everything deer in the UP, uh, which is kind of a monumental task. But we do appreciate all the work he does and keeping us up to date on what's happening with deer and being our central clearinghouse for, for deer management up the peninsula. So Everyone's very busy. And they're all doing their part. Yes, certainly. You do have an awesome team up there. And uh, congratulations to Brian for his new position as the large yeah. carnivore specialist. Thanks for mentioning that. That's a really cool role, and I'm happy he's going to be moving into it. Um, and congratulations to Rachel Leggett, too, for her CDL certification. Well, thanks, Bill. It's always a joy chatting with you, and we appreciate you taking the time to tell us about your meaningful work that's been happening across the UP. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to share the story of what we do in the UP for the citizens of the state of Michigan. Well, don't fly away, folks, or you'll miss all things feathers coming up next. There are many camping and lodging opportunities available in Michigan State Parks. 
When you choose State Park Campgrounds, you get more than just a campsite. State Parks offer a diverse range of recreational opportunities including hands-on instructional classes, nature programs, places to fish, boat launches, family-friendly events, and much more. Reservations can be made six months in advance, so why wait? Visit MIDNRreservations.com or call 1-800-44-PARKS to make a reservation. Each winter, Michigan transforms into a haven for large feathered visitors from the north, including snowy owls, boreal owls, great gray owls, and the northern hawk owl. Now, surprisingly, these majestic owls choose to spend their winters in Michigan for its milder weather compared to the harsh conditions of the Arctic tundra. During this snowy January episode, it only makes sense that we would be talking about the ghosts of winter, the snowy owl. Snowy owls are a visitor to Michigan most winters. However, it's not a native species to the state, which means it does not breed or reproduce here. It only visits occasionally. Now, this is strictly a bird of open country, as it almost is never spotted in trees and much prefers being in large, open expanses. So it will sit directly on the ground or on rooftops, sometimes telephone poles, or other outcroppings where it's in the open and it can see freely to, to find food. And it thrives in our snowiest Michigan weathers because it is a species specifically adapted for the icy Arctic tundra. Now, we do occasionally get to see these birds in the wintertime in Michigan, as this is their overwintering grounds where they come to feed and take refuge during the Arctic winters when food can be scarce. They're most often spotted by people during the daytime. They are a diurnal species um, and only hunt during the daytime for the most part, which is different from our native owl species, which are primarily nocturnal, uh, which means they're only hunting at nighttime. Now, because the Arctic has periods of the year with 24-hour daylight, these owls have adapted to hunting during the day and hunting in mostly that treeless tundra landscape. Now, while they're in the Arctic, the snowy owl's primary food source are lemmings, which are a really small rodent. And we do have a species of lemmings that can be found here in Michigan, the southern bog lemming. Now, these lemmings are really similar in appearance to voles with a really short nose and tail. Uh, however, when lemmings become scarce in the Arctic due to natural uh, population changes that occur in small lemmings, the snowy owls will also prey on other small rodents and even some birds like ducks and other waterfowl. Owl breeding season does follow the patterns of lemming abundance. And while lemmings are less abundant, the owls will tend to raise less young. Because of the cyclical nature of this predator-prey relationship, snowy owls tend to need to travel south when the lemmings are less abundant, when their food source has become scarce. Now, when the lemming population is low, uh, we tend to see more owls move to Michigan in the wintertime, and we call those years of high owl numbers eruptions, as they don't necessarily occur every year. Uh, but during an eruption year, those snowy owls can travel great distances south to find food. They will end up in Michigan, but they even have been reported as far south as Florida and Texas. Uh, so they will travel to find good food sources. Do you think that if they were going to drink a beverage, they would drink lemmingade? I'd like to think so. Snowy owls are comparable in size to another large owl species that we have here, the great horned owl. Those snowy owls and great horned owls have the same wingspan of 55 inches. The snowy owl is the largest by weight in North America. 55 inches blew my mind, though, when I read that that's what their wingspan is, because that's me. I think I'm 56 inches. That's a full-grown adult person for a wingspan, which is remarkable. And on top of having a wingspan that size, snowy owls only weigh between three and six pounds. It's all those hollow bones. It is the hollow bones, yes. Bird bones are hollow. Maintain a light weight despite their sometimes pretty big size. Now, the snowy owl's feathers uh, typically present as all white, and that makes its large yellow eyes really stand out in addition to a curved bluish-black beak. Now, immature birds and females typically have black and brown bars, 
which mark all over their body and their wings. And females will use this salt and pepper type pattern to help them blend in with the snow and the rocks while they're sitting on their ground nests. Um, however, the males, as they age, will lose those darker markings and will become that striking, completely white feather, uh, which is spectacular to see always. This winter, you'll want to look for snowy owls in open fields and near lake shores where they hunt for voles and other small critters. But if you do plan on viewing snowy owls, you'll want to make sure to do it carefully and respectfully. So to ensure a positive experience for you as the bird watcher and your fellow bird watchers and the owls, we do have a few tips that we want to share with you. First, always give snowy owl space. And really that goes beyond snowy owls. You want to give all wildlife space if you're watching it. So you can use binoculars or a birding scope to view them from a distance. Um, and you can, and if you cause the owl to move or to flush, like if it is scared or disturbed and it leaves, uh, that's how you know you've gotten too close. And so you will need to leave that area to allow the bird to come back. Another tip is to avoid luring owls with audio recordings. So it can be really tempting to play owl calls to hear what calls back to you or what responds. But that can be very stressful to owls and other birds in the area. So it's best to ma maintain a safe distance and not use any kind of um, audio call to call in birds or see what calls back to you. And that goes the same with baiting. Leave live baiting to professionals. Using live bait to attract owls can be very dangerous. Um, and owls may associate people with food if you continuously feed them or try to bait them. And that will leave both the owls and humans in some really risky situations. So leave that to the professionals. So the fake owl calls, let's say that you successfully call in an owl because they think, oh, one of my other owl friends is over here. I'm going to go check them out. And then they see it's just a lousy human. That's probably like the owl equivalent of getting the, hey, we've been trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty type calls. It's a scammer. Yeah. And lastly, try not to gather in large groups when observing the bird, uh, because this can be really overwhelming and disturbing to an owl. So if you're following birding pages and you're seeing recommendations for locations on where snowy owls have been observed, try to go when you think other people might not be viewing the bird or try to you know, limit the amount of people who are going at one time or in one place just so that there's not this horde of people watching this bird that could cause a disturbance. Follow those tips for an awesome time winter bird watching this season. Stick around because All Things Fur is coming up next. Pure Michigan hunt applications are on sale now. If you want your shot of what is considered Michigan's ultimate hunt, pick up a $5 application or two. There's no limit to the number you can buy. If you're one of the three lucky winners, you'll get a hunting prize package worth thousands, as well as licenses for elk, bear, spring and fall turkey, antlerless deer, and first pick at a managed waterfowl area for a reserved hunt. Purchase anywhere hunting licenses are sold or online at michigan.gov slash pmh. Try to catch me hollering at the moon. Now, if you were tuned in to listen about the snowy owl, you may have been able to predict a little foreshadowing of the furry critter we're chatting about in this segment. A food source for many avian species like owl and an interesting little critter that scoots around under the snow this time of year, the southern bog lemming. These lemmings are closely related to voles, weighing in at a mere 20 to 50 grams, though the average size is 35 grams, and measuring four to five inches in total length. So they're little critters. The fur on their back often ranges in colors from chestnut to dark brown and has a grizzled appearance, while the sides are like a silvery gray. They are rodents, and their incisors are broad and longitudinally grooved, which is one of the distinguishing characteristics for how you know you have a lemming and not a vole. What exactly is longitudinally grooved? Let's just Google it. What did you do for work today? Oh, I looked at pictures of rat teeth. <laughs> There's a groove that runs down the long side of the tooth. You'd probably have to get really close to see that groove. Like it's not oh, something you'd sure. be like, ooh, look at that bog lemming over there. I can tell it's a bog lemming because of the grooves that are vertically in its teeth. Right. 
you're going to have to use a microscope and either have an extraordinarily patient lemming or it will have to be deceased in order to get that close to see its see its teeth. But maybe if you find a, an owl pellet and you dig it open and you find a little skull inside and the teeth have vertical grooves, you will know that that was a bog lemming that was most likely eaten by something like a snowy owl. You will. And that is a great activity. Digging apart owl pellets to see what the bones that are inside is always interesting. There is also a northern bog lemming. And I believe one of the distinguishing features is something to do with their teeth as well. So you could really do some investigating. Looking at those kinds of teeth in an owl pellet, you'd be able to tell if you have a lemming or a shrew or a mouse or a vole because they all have very different teeth. And you can see exactly what that owl is eating which is pretty cool. You could become a rodent tooth expert simply by investigating owl pellets. What a hobby. I collect spores, molds, and fungus. You probably have never seen Ghostbusters, so you probably didn't get the reference, right? No. Egon. I'm sure someone who is more educated than I would have laughed at that good joke. I'm sorry that I disappointed you. You took me at face value. You're just like, okay, yeah, I can see that. If it's got anything to do with any kind of modern day pop culture movie reference. Over my head like a snowy owl. Well, the tail of the southern bog lemming is short and barely longer than its hind foot. And they have four toes with one small nail covered thumb on the forefoot and five toes on the hind feet. Now, these females have six mammae, which are, it's like a milk secreting organ that mammals have, which differentiates the species from its closest relative, the northern bog lemming, which has eight mammae. Now, unsurprisingly, there is little known about the mating systems of southern bog lemmings, mostly because they spend all of their time underground. But we do know that they breed year round, especially when food is abundant, and we'll have two litters of three to five individuals that are birthed every year. Um, and those young are born furless with no eyesight and their ears are closed. So not a lot of defense mechanisms for them as soon as they're birthed. But the claws are apparent. However, they grow really quickly because by the end of their first week, they will be covered in fur and their ears will have opened and their eyesight is developing. And then they're ready to be eaten by snowy <laughs> owls. They are. So the life expectancy of lemmings is not very long. Um, they most of most don't live beyond one year. Um, in fact, most will die after three months. So they live fast and die young. Lemmings are active throughout the day and the night and are active throughout the entire year. They do not hibernate through the winter, but rather slow down their activity when temperatures drop below 19 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, these lemmings occur in a wide variety of habitats, but as their common name suggests, they are often found in sphagnum bogs and low, moist places. But it wouldn't be too uncommon to find them in grasslands or mixed forests, um, other wetlands, places with lots of vegetation to cover um, their trails and where they spend all of their time underground in moist soils. They prefer areas with a thick mat of herbaceous and shrubby vegetation, and the distribution of the southern bog lemming within their larger geographic range is pretty patchy, uh, which may be in part due to competition with meadow voles, which is like top competitor for resources is meadow voles. These southern bog lemmings will travel around in very specific pathways. So we mentioned that they need a lot of herbaceous cover, um, and that's because they will burrow five to 11 inches deep underground, as well as run on the surface, which are often located among roots of shrubs or beneath sphagnum moss. So right below the surface of the soil or across leaf litter and root level. Totally herbaceous, dude. That's the bog lemming slogan. A lemming runway is a distinct feature that can be identified as piles of grass clippings that are about three inches in length, are left nearby on these pathways in addition to their droppings, which are a bright, light green color. So that's the kinds of food sources that they eat. You see lots of lime greens and light green colors in bogs. Um, and so it's natural that those are the small piles of scat you would find in these little, um, tiny little pathways. I think you can picture like what a deer trail looks like, but just on a much, much smaller scale. I feel like they, with the little lime green droppings, they should be called bog limings. 
<laughs> New nickname. I'm really just pulling some great ones out of here today. <laughs> Starting 2024 off right. These tiny bog dwellers create cozy round nests about five inches in diameter made of dried leaves and grass and some soft materials like fur that have two to four entrances for quick entries and escapes. In the summertime, these nests are often placed on the ground amidst grassy vegetation or on top of sphagnum hummocks. And in the wintertime, they're commonly found three to five inches below the ground. Given their habitat type and um, their teeth shape, lemons are mostly herbivorous and are eating herbaceous plants like leaves, clovers, grasses, and seeds. However, they will also eat small invertebrates such as slugs, snails, and beetles, both full-grown beetles and in their larval state. These lemmings are an extremely important piece of our ecosystems as they are a key prey species for raptors and other mammals such as owls, as we've mentioned, and foxes, coyotes, and weasels. I mean, this is like nature's popcorn to carnivores, it sounds like. That's an excellent way to think about it, yes. Actually, while I was doing, while I was researching snowy owls, I read that they eat uh, 1,600 lemmings a year. That's the average diet, which... Makes sense if you eat about three lemmings a day. A couple snowy owls could probably put a pretty good dent in a lemming population in an area. They would be in high demand. That's a lot of lemmings to eat. If you're a snowy owl, when life gives you lemmings, conduct a lemming raid. <laughs> ah, yes. The oh-so-short life of the bog lemming. Michigan.gov slash DNR Trails is your destination for trail maps, trail etiquette, and trail closure information. Trail information for biking, cross-country skiing, horseback riding, hiking, off-road vehicle riding, snowmobiling, snowshoeing, and even water trails for kayaking and canoeing are available. While you're there, remember to check out information about pet-friendly recreation, track chairs, and the Iron Bell Trail. All available at Michigan.gov slash DNR Trails. Now is your opportunity to win a Wild Talk podcast mug. As a thank you to our listeners, we'll be giving away a mug or two every episode. Our December mug winners are Becca Pouch and Don Cortes. Check your email as we'll be getting in touch with you soon. They answered the question, what is Michigan State Reptile? The answer is the Painted Turtle. Now, to be entered into the drawing this month, test your wildlife knowledge and answer our quiz question. This month's question is, most frog and toad species in Michigan bury themselves deep below water and soil to prevent being frozen. However, three Michigan frog species have an anti-freeze-like substance in their bodies that allows them to survive the winter while buried only in shallow soil or leaf litter. What are the three species that have this adaptation? Email your name and answer to us at dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov to be entered for a chance to win a mug. Be sure to include the subject line as mug me and submit your answer by January 15th. We'll announce winners and the answer on next month's podcast. So be sure to listen in to see if you've won and for the next quiz question. Good luck, everyone. Michigan conservation officers are working hard to protect and keep the outdoors safe for current and future generations. If you witness a natural resources violation, you can call or text the Report All Poaching hotline 24 hours a day at 1-800-292-7800 or fill out the complaint form available at michigan.gov slash rap. If you would like more information on becoming a conservation officer, click on become a CO at michigan.gov slash conservation officers. Well, thanks for joining us on this January edition of the Wild Talk podcast. Remember, if you have questions about wildlife or hunting, you can call 517-284-WILD or email us at dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov. We'll see you back here in February. This has been the Wild Talk podcast, your monthly podcast airing the first of each month and offering insights into the world of wildlife across the state of Michigan. You can reach the Wildlife Division at 517-284-9453 or dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov.